There we go. So uh, on behalf of the data mesh learning community, welcome to uh, today's session is entitled Operating Model for Data Mesh. Uh, and I think as, a, as many of you know, data has been called the fuel of the modern enterprise. It's a source of information that powers business decisions, improves operations, creates innovations, and obviously enables outstanding customer outcomes. Now, data mesh is a modern approach and it helps us drive these outcomes much more effectively and efficiently. Uh, and it advocates for a number of different principles. I won't go into these details, I'll just summarize, but uh, obviously domain ownership with clear boundaries and empowered data product owners um, that are most uh, knowledgeable about their domain, uh, treating data as a product, making it discoverable, understandable, trustworthy, and interoperable. Uh, Self-serve, uh, where platforms are available to make data easy to find, consume, share, and all with a minimal amount of manual intervention. And obviously, last but not least, federated governance that uh, makes data product owners uh, uh, with that accountability, that local accountability, also provides the guardrails and constraints that uh, allow it to work properly in an enterprise. Now, all of these principles obviously resonate to this community. That's why you're here, okay? Uh, and we're all about now moving from these principles and putting them into practice. Uh, but there's really a, a, you know, a number of aspects about putting data mesh into practice. There's architecture, um, patterns, tech stack, and the list goes on. And there's tons of stuff that's been written about these topics. Uh, and that's not the topic for today's discussion. But what I find is that there's not as much information around how uh, you can make data mesh fit into your organizational domain. So we're going to talk about things like what are the teams in the data mesh? How are they structured? How do we find and grow the data product data products in the data mesh? How do we grow our data mesh? How do we provide the incentives that allow us to, to encourage people to participate, have the, the data producers actually participate and, and drive the, the value that comes from consuming uh, elements of the data mesh. Now, all of these questions are related to operating model for data mesh. And, and obviously in our belief here, this is one of the keys to data mesh success. So that's where our discussion will go today. And to discuss this topic, we have several experienced data mesh practitioners with us today. So let's have them introduce themselves. Sarita, why don't we start with you? Thank you. And thank you for having me, Eric, on this talk. It's really a pleasure to be part of the community. I'm Sarita Bax. I am uh, from JP Morgan. I head up the product area uh, called data management, where we create uh, services and products to build a data mesh. Uh, it includes all things from cataloging of the data, defining the entitlements, defining the, and, and making available the migration services, instantiating the lakes, lake houses, warehouses, um, and ultimately publishing and consuming the data. So all of those products are um, something that my team is building. And so we're really excited to talk about how do we engage in that operating model? How do we use those services? Who are the actors? So that we can um, create the data and make that data known and usable to the broader community within and outside the organization. Awesome. Happy to be so, here. Thank you, Sarita. Glad to have you. Uh, Amara, tell us about yourself. Eric, thank you for having me. Um, Hi everyone, my name is Amara. I'm a principal business analyst. I am a consultant and I work for a company called as ThoughtWorks. And in my role, I'm leading a data mesh initiative for a large pharmaceutical company in Switzerland. And it's a very, um, you, may, you may have heard of it, it's called as Roche. And uh, yeah, as part of this role, um, I'm leading teams uh, which are trying to implement data mesh, roll out data mesh uh, in different aspects of it on all aspects of data mesh really, uh, from data product teams to onboarding different domains, uh, to setting up the platforms as well as um, really the operating model that is needed to actually uh, scale a data mesh as well. Um, as a consultant, I really have the chance to see what practicalities of implementing and rolling out such an operating model looks like. And yeah, I'm very interested and excited to discuss this with the other experts in this panel as well. Thank you, Mira. Wonderful having you on board. Last but not least, Jean-Georges Perrin. Tell us about yourself, my friend. Hey, uh, Eric, thank you. Thank you for having me. Um, so I'm Jean-Georges Perrin. Uh, if Jean-Georges is too difficult, I go by JG. Um, I'm not forcing anyone to take years of French to just try to pronounce my first name. I'm uh, the intelligence platform lead at PayPal, um, and we've been building a, a data mesh. 
as, as a side topic, we are, we are all talking for ourselves and not for our companies. Um, and uh, uh, I also uh, read a little book about data mesh. Uh, it's probably not as exciting as uh, as Jamak's book, but I think it's 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 I think it's probably funnier. Uh, and uh, I live in upstate New York, uh, and uh, I I'm unfortunately there's a last minute thing that that came on me and I will not be there for the entire hour for you with you guys so if you want to reach out on LinkedIn be be, be my guest I, I take only these easy questions and leave uh, the other ones for Sharita and Amara so, so that was a strategy actually <laughs> John George thank you very much again as John George mentioned each of these panel members here are speaking on their own behalf and not for their company now, uh, my name is Eric Broda. I'm president of my own consulting company called Broda Group Software, and I'm your panel moderator for today's discussion. Now, we're going to try and keep this dialogue as free-flowing as possible, and while we have a few prepared questions, we're also going to be taking questions in the chat. So, so if you do have some, some questions, feel free to put them in there, and uh, we'll try and mix them in as we go. So, uh, with that in mind, why don't we get started? So, uh, I'm going to start with uh, Jean Georges, because you have to leave a little bit early. So uh, the title for this session is Operating Model for Data Mesh. So let's start with the basics. Um, some say an operating model describes the way an organization works that touches upon an organization's structure, its teams, processes, technology, and everything in between. But what is your definition, Jean Georges, of an operating model? Well, it, it's it's really about how we interact with, with the different things. It's about, I would say, building the data mesh, specifically in the context of the data mesh, right? It's, it's about building the data mesh, filling the data mesh with data and operating it as well, okay? And of course, the relationship with our stakeholders and partners within the enterprise. So it's, it's a mouthful um, and we've, um, yeah, we've been, We've been we've been pretty busy uh, at, at that part, and I think it also shifts over time. Um, as we went to production just before Christmas, we we're shifting from well, we're still building and we're still adding feature to the core product, but now we are also um, adding more and more data in it and, and creating more and more data products, and. Uh, as well as the ops part, which is coming. For a year, we had zero bugs, really. And, and now we've got users and they're bringing bugs, okay? So so we've got to take care of that as well, okay? So those users, terrible. Okay, so yeah, that's 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 where we are. <laughs> Perfect, uh, thank you, Jean-Georges. Amara, uh, how would you answer that question? What is an operating model for you? Um, I think it, it makes sense to take a step back and look at what is it that we're trying to achieve with data mesh. And very often we are trying to solve a problem and we remember that data mesh is a paradigm shift, right? It's an experiment that we're trying to get more value from our data. Um, very often we find that we are trying to approach the same problem in terms of a, a technical approach. If I have a set of platform or if I just start treating my data like a data product, um, and, you know, I'm making it interoperable. I have the six characteristics of a data product. Mm -hmm. Then my, my, my job is mostly done. On the contrary, with data mesh itself, you're saying, hey, it's much more than that. It's about the way we, the, the way we think about the, the data, the way we interact with each other among different teams, um, the way we prioritize, the way we think in terms of cross-domain value. An operating model, in my opinion, is basically the structure that we are setting up that enables this value from data to be uh, achieved. Um, it means um, all the structures that come with it in terms of how should the teams be defined? How should they be incentivized? Um, what are the new roles and responsibilities that come as a result of it? What are the enabling teams that allow new teams to start becoming data product teams? Um, how does the data mesh model fit into existing structures of prioritization, existing structures of um, value-based thinking, reaching your business and financial goals? So embedding the data mesh and bringing the concept of the operating model change, the, the paradigm shift into your framework and making it part of your day-to-day -day business execution in my opinion, that's what the entire concept of the operating model is about. 
Awesome, Amara. Thank you very much. So, so obviously this is about driving value and it's about how you organize and structure yourself for success. Sarita, tell us, you know, how would you contrast your perspective uh, on operating models with Amara's? Are they the same? Are there some nuances that you found in your travels at JPMC? Yeah, I, I think we're very much of the same opinion on the need to put some structure together to execute and make sure that there's prioritization and the right actors. And I would extend that a bit. Um, hopefully, Amari, you'll agree with the extension as well. Um, we, we, it takes a village to create a data mesh, right? And it's not necessarily that the people in the village are performing the same exact tasks. Um, and there's expertise of those individuals and the roles that they play and bring to the creation of any project that we're working on. And Data Mesh is no different from that perspective. And we really have to go think about the, the RACI and the actors, right? There's expertise on uh, the platform engineers, there's expertise of the data engineers, the business subject matter experts, the portfolio managers of the data, and who is responsible or accountable or consulted or informed within that process so that everybody can you know, come into the office virtually or physically and know what their responsibility is to contribute to the greater good of creating the data mesh in this case. And so that everybody can understand their role, the satisfaction that they bring to themselves as participants in that project and feel that empowerment to contribute to the data mission. So the operating model helps us define those constructs and ultimately helps us underpinning define the culture and, and influence the culture of an organization. Operating models tend to be very um, structured and that's, important but what's more important is the culture that it influences and creates that that thinking of sharing data contributing data um, creating products both data products and services to the greater good of what is meant to be built awesome sarita let me ask you a follow-up question so so uh you mentioned culture so so um when i've talked to practitioners globally uh, I've, I've been reminded many times that the, the organization culture, to use that term in North America, may be a little bit more entrepreneurial, let's say, and I'm painting it in kind of simple terms here, whereas in Europe and parts of Asia, it's much more deliberate. Um, how does culture fit into to your data mesh operating model? When have you had to adjust it when you're talking about deployment in North America or Europe or perhaps Asia? Yeah, sure. And of course, um, there's there's definitely those stereotypes of, of the different regions. And, and I, I know as well as you do that those stereotypes are not uh, one size fits all mm. to those regions. And uh, there are just humans that have uh, you know, leanings one way or another, no matter where they are. Um, but you're right, right? We have to think about how does the organization operate today where pre-data mesh, there were silos, right? I have my data in my box. I'm going to ship it over to your data in your box. We're going to create a contract and a very rigid sharing agreement. And, uh, you know, we'll get on the um, waterfall-based project management. And two years later, you'll have a file maybe that maybe met the needs of, of what you were hoping to receive. Um, and, and we need that still the contracts and we still need the expectation management between the producers and the consumers. But as we get into the, the data mesh, can we unlock more knowledge, um, self-serve knowledge, self-serve influence of how things are being built, how that data is being described and made available. Um, and, and you're right, in the different regions, there's definitely uh, regulatory regimes that necessitate a lot of structure in, in the US and outside the US. And so we, we can't falter on that, but that sharing mentality becomes more and more pervasive in our organizations, no matter the region and the regulatory regime with the data mesh constructs. And I think just that mindset goes a long way in, in conversations and in project execution. 
So I hope I answered the question. I no, think I no. went in a roundabout. No, no, that was actually very good. Um, but we do have uh, Amara, who's out of uh, uh, Europe. Uh, so, so Amara, when you when you look at kind of North America, we're, we're, we may have a slightly different again stereotypes. Emphasize that um, we may have a you may have a different perspective of what you see locally versus what you see when you're dealing with folks in North America or even Asia. From a European perspective, how how do you deal with culture and mold it to to uh, accelerate your data mesh journey? Yeah, so I I have the experience and I can only speak for the European organizations that I'm part of, and uh, they're primarily based in Germany and Switzerland. So um, um, pre-planning and having structure and process is something that's very, very ingrained into the culture very, very often. Um, having said that, um, many of the healthcare and pharmaceutical companies are very federated by nature already. So independent verticals actually exist as their own companies themselves. Um, within the boundaries of those federated subdomains, I would say, um, there's again, clear processes, and then there are clear governance structures, and then there are clear bodies that are uh, defining the roles. Um, SAFE, for example, is a very, very popular uh, methodology that you try to use in order to roll out things because it has structure. Uh, and when you're trying to introduce a concept like data mesh, and even without the, the whole, uh, all aspects of data mesh, just even if you think about the, the concept of empowering your teams, you know, and, and letting your data product teams make those decisions and certain decisions, we're trying to um, bring decisions closer to where it is necessary. Um, it takes away some of that central control. And I think this is a deeply uncomfortable um, uh, thought and uh, it's a change in the way of actually delegating and it's a change in the way of how you approach things. And data mesh just doesn't take that one step further. It takes it a couple of steps further. It's in not only in terms of uh, um, product thinking and data product teams as such, but also in terms of um, don't over engineer your, your governance in terms. The whole concept of having federated computational governance, like so, so try and automate more where possible and federate your governance and bring the decisions closer to the domains where the decisions need to be made. Um, and so, yeah, I, I think there are domains that are lead um, and, and there are sub teams um, where they really feel that pain of not having the data and they really need this data in order to make decisions and they need data from other uh, parts of the company where they need to make these decisions. They've already felt the pain um, and they are willing to actually take that step faster than others. And to me, I don't know whether that has much to do with a regional influence rather than uh, an influence of I have tried a couple of methodologies before. We have spent the last 20 years on this. I'm willing to try anything else right now. Data mesh seems to make sense. Got it, got it. So, so Jean-Georges, I'll, I'll give you the next question. There's a few terms that have come up, obviously the word teams, uh, but also I, I like uh, Sarita's phrase, it takes a village. So, so when, when you think about the kind of the fundamental building blocks of an operating model, it's it's, it's teams. Now, uh, there's a fantastic book out there by Matthew Skelton, Manuel uh, Pais, and it's called Team Topologies, and they define four kind of distinct teams. There's a stream-aligned uh, team, platform teams, enabling teams, and complicated system teams. So, so, so we think of data product teams as stream-aligned, um, but what type of teams do you see are crucial as you deploy data products and data mesh in your organization? Uh, yeah, so I, I, I like the comment about uh, it takes a village as well, because I just wrote a piece for the internal PayPal blog where it takes a village and looking at all the partnership we're, we're having to, to, to build this, this data mesh within an organization like ours. So when, when we look at the different teams, I think it, it depends Who's, who's in charge of what? Okay, so so the, the way we the way we built our our data mesh, we had uh, we had various teams, and some some were definitely really stream aligned, whereas we are really, especially when it comes to the infrastructure and interacting with the different components and the different existing infrastructure, and I would even say infrastructure with an S at PayPal, that. This is a really complex system. So when it terms of organizing 
your 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 work streams um there's some there's some things that are i would say almost pretty obvious okay like hey we've got to keep the light on and that's probably a very uh, a very a, a very easy stream to to follow and, and then you've got to dig into uh, interfacing with your security system, with your uh, database layers, uh, and so, and I think, I think what what kept us sane uh, was to align with with with, with the different pla planes and the experience planes that Jamak describes in her book. Okay, so we've got you know the infrastructure uh, experience plane, you've got the data product experience plane, and, and, and the mesh experience plane. I think that. Keeping that and and having the team aligned to not always to directly to the plane, but at least the features aligned to the planes, and then having the teams that are working according to this feature, uh, I think that that keeps our sanity at a reasonable level. <laughs> okay, perfect, perfect. One of the, the when we think about a data product team, um, and especially the concept, I think we've talked about it here, this notion of local autonomy. Uh, so, so when you think about a data product team, and in, in particular, the data product owner, um, local autonomy, really, practically speaking, means having the ability to own the, you know, execute and own the decisions that you actually make. So, so Sarita, let's start with you. When you think about the data, the role of the data product owner um, and uh, given, empowering them with decision rights, how far do you go? So I'll give you a very practical scenario. Um, as an enterprise architect in the past, uh, you like to have fewer platforms. So, so I'd like to have folks standardize on one tech stack. Whereas if I'm an empowered uh, data product owner, I may want to use a unique tech stack. How do I, how do I balance the two uh, to, to, make it to, so to let it make sense and actually move forward in a reasonable fashion? Oh, absolutely. And I'll reuse Amara's word federated, right? And we really should dive into what that means because I think we throw the word federated around quite loosely. Um, does federated mean that I've given entire autonomy to a team? No, that would mean decentralized, right? Um, so federated has a connotation of a, a spine within the organization that's kind of saying what the rules of engagement are and then those teams feel empowered as long as they stay within the boundaries of the rules of engagement. It doesn't necessarily mean that they have to use all of the same solutions and services that they build, but if they do build their own solution, it has to be compliant and conformant to the rules in the center, right? And, and, and I think sometimes people don't think of that as federated. If they are beholden still to some central definition, they're saying, oh, that, that's central, right? And, and sometimes they think I could do whatever I want. And, and that means you're decentralizing the entirety of the execution. And, and so you need something in between. Um, of course, as the lead of, of the product development of data management platforms, I would be thrilled. Uh, if we can develop one single set of services and everybody would use it, right? But that is unrealistic um, in, in any company, um, in any company of any size, uh, because there is so much evolution happening in the, in the industry and in technology that we can't say that any one central team knows every single thing that's going to be needed now and in the future and the best way to deliver it. So absolutely, we have to give the product owners some latitude to uh, innovate within uh, the product stack that we are converging on. Um, and so, you know, firm-wide tools, central tools, and the ability to extend them and deliver that innovative set of tools uh, within some rules, right? Perfect. We can't just all go out and, and, and build anything that we want. It's not about that product owner having entire latitude to do anything there still has to be a little bit of a interaction between a central team and, and the extended teams. Absolutely. Amira, I, I forgot to ask you your perspective on teams. So if you could do me a favor, uh, what, what, what teams do you see in a data mesh? And then if you can come, if we can come back to that empowered data product owner tech stack question, your perspective on that. So over to you. Okay, sure. 
Oh, um, oh, that, oh sorry. Sorry, Amira. Sorry. All right. Um, so thanks, yeah. Uh, Sarita, I really like your analogy that you used here. But um, to me, um, when for those of us who have read team topologies, and when in team topologies we describe, we have stream aligned teams, you have your platform teams, and then you have your complicated subsystems teams and enabling teams. It's actually a really nice correlation that we can make to, to data mesh as well. Because sure, you have your, your self-service uh, platform teams which are core and central to your data mesh and then you have the obvious you have your data product teams but what I also really like is uh, this concept called as this enabling teams and we more and more see the concept of having um, a central uh, team which is basically trying to drive this data mesh initiative across the company, especially because it's still in its initial phases um, and, and, and we're still in its adapting phase uh, that a central team of enabling teams. So it could be a, a group of enabling teams that are actually being embedded in different domains to help them kickstart and to get, get them like set up to do some of the basic infrastructure for them, to get them the, like the first shell data product out there, you know? Um, and so just the way, as you were saying, Sarita, within the guidelines of what are the basic guidelines, um, a central team like this could potentially define what we call as the MVP checklist of a data product. And it could have something as simple as, a data product needs to have a data product owner. It needs to be assigned to a domain. It needs to be published somewhere. It needs to be shoppable, right? And even building these constructs and giving it to a new domain that's starting this out for the first time. And very often when we say domains, we're talking about these business units. We're talking about business units that don't really have IT infrastructure. And in the traditional model are basically handing over their requirements to an IT organization, a central IT organization. So we must remember that they're starting out for the first time and they need some kickstart. So the concept of these um, enabling teams is also a major core component in data mesh. And finally, I really like this, this idea of talking about um, complicated teams as well, because somebody should be chasing after those, uh, uh, those use cases that are now potentially possible because different domains are thinking about uh, their data products. So now for the first time, it's possible to envision what can be done. Um, what, what is it not that exists in terms of processes today and dashboards that can be generated today, but now that we have the data available and we have it available as products and we can actually play with them and we can, we can treat them like Lego products almost and see combinations and permutations what are those cross domain use cases that are potentially so valuable to a company? So these specialized teams that can actually show those first set of successes. So to me, that is also a core component. Outside that, of course, there should be a governance team in some companies that could be your chief data officers, your stewards, your, your data stewards, your governance as such structures as well. But that is really not very different from your existing structure as it exists today. Okay, perfect, Elmira. Thank you. Let me, I'm going to, I'm just going to ask a follow-up question, uh, kind of related, but uh, I want to talk a little bit about Conway's law. And if I were to paraphrase it for those that haven't, I've, most people have probably heard about it, but your systems and their data inevitably follow your organizational and communication structure. Now, my experience is that that has some pretty profound implications, but how do you factor Conway's law in, in, into how you select your data product teams? How do you keep your data products you know, uh, within or do do they actually have you had success having them span organizational units? Um, I would say, have we had success spanning completely different organizational units till now? Unfortunately, not. We haven't. However, have we had success uh, spanning over sub? units, so like subdomains of bigger domains. Um, I, and I'll, I'll try and give you an example here. Uh, a big part of pharmaceutical industry is also the manufacturing component of it, you know, so it's like think about um, your devices that you actually are using in your home um, uh, healthcare systems. And um, they need to be manufactured and often they follow a hub and spoke model as well. So you have a central hub which basically is, is, is driving this manufacturing process. And then the spokes basically are, are, are in different countries that are also kind of following it and then uh, adapting it to their local structure. Um, and so in such cases, we've had major success that within the boundaries of a sim, sim, single domain, a single business unit, 
we have been we have allowed we have we've been able to bring um, uh, harmonization to how the hubs and all the different spokes are actually talking about their data products and these are spanning across hubs and spokes the original way of it existing was every hub and every spoke did it individually and so it was the same data almost just specific to its individual countries and affiliates that was actually bringing out the data to us and when it needed it so we've had structure um, success in that aspect of actually trying to negate the Conway's law, uh, negate the existing uh, organizational structures and communication structures that existed today uh, by, by targetedly going after the use cases and the business value they deliver rather than where in the organization do they sit today and who's responsible for it. So use case first, hypothesis first, and identifying the data products from the use case has been our go-to factor. Perfect, Amara. Uh, Sarita, uh, tell me, uh, tell me your perspective on Conway's law and, and it, very simple question, I suppose. I've not found terribly many people that actually have a data successfully deployed a data product across multiple organization units, you know, very similar experience to Amira, but tell, tell us yours. Have you, have you been able to have success that way or not, or, or what's your perspective? Yeah. So I think we cannot fight Conway's law. <laughs> it is a law because it is human nature. Um, and if we try to uh, fight against human nature, we will lose. Uh, it, it, you, we can change cultures, we can set up races all we like, um, but people have uh, a leaning towards staying within their own organizational and communication structures. Um, what we can do though, is recognize, again, from a data perspective, all of the sharing that's taken place, whether it was in the context of a mesh or in the context of our legacy on-prem systems, and find those opportunities where the data was shared across organizational units and find uh, through technology and through the sharing, uh, through the data mesh, find a couple of opportunities to not move the data, not copy the data, create a single data product and encourage those consuming teams to bring their data to the tool, sorry, bring their tools to the data and not the data to the tools. And I think that that is one way of just starting to pick away at Conway's law, as opposed to saying that we need a data product that officially spans organizational bounds. We just say, hey, we have especially master data, right? Uh, reference data in the, in, in the firm Nobody wants to create a copy of it. Nobody wants to recreate it. And so if we bring that forward as a data product and then have a, a number of use cases that can benefit from it, we've inherently started just picking a, a way that uh, the pre pre predilection to, to create an organizational line solution. Okay, perfect. Now, now, a lot of the stuff that you talked about, Sarita, this is a question for you again, a quick follow-up. Um, you know, there may be some challenges in building data, data products that span organizational use, but ultimately, whether you try and do that or not, the key to success in any data product is the incentives that we provide. So, so incentives, you know, enforce or change behavior, as we all know, and they, they have a clear impact on our, our operating model. Um, tell me about how you, your, your organization perhaps provides incentives to more rapidly identify data products, more rapidly build them, more rapidly connect them into the broader data mesh. Tell me the, the incentives that you use to counter these inevitable human, uh, human behavior defaults. Yeah, and I think it's consistently focusing on the business value that we are producing. Um, we do not get a win by creating a data product in its own right, on its own. We get a win when we apply that data product to a business program to a business incentive. Sometimes that business program is generating actual hard dollars. Sometimes that business program is bringing efficiencies. Sometimes it is a risk aversion, but either way, there's a quantifiable business result of a program. And that program will hopefully be dependent on one or many data products being created. Um, if we only count the number of data products as a uh, something of realized value, um, I think we'll fall short and we'll go right back into Conway's law. But if we band together to bring value to the business, 
and our customers, the real customers of the business, not the consumers of the data, but the customers of the business, whether it's internal, external customers of the business, it keeps us focused on the goal. And the goal is to drive business value. The goal is not to create data products. Absolutely. I love that answer. Amara, tell us about your, your thoughts. What incentives have you found worked in the past? Um, I, I just want to like highlight the point that Sarita just mentioned because I love it so much. Um, not, I mean, the real end users of the data and not just uh, the people who are getting it in between as well. So that's also always a challenge, um, the, ben the difference between uh, benefit and actual customer value as well. Um, so yeah, uh, I wish it was as straightforward as saying, um, yeah, usage of data product and what is it actually generating as a result of it. Um, but practically the experience we have found is um, different domains, different business units are very at very, very different stages of their journey. Um, so at this point of time, when we are looking at in incentivizing different domains to even continue grow their data mesh journey, it's um, even a simple thing like saying, you have published your data as a data product is step one success. Your data product is shoppable. Oh, yay, part two. You know, you would think it is that simple, but it's it's really not. Um, but it's also kind of understandable because quite often when we are we're, we're talking to these um, um, shadow IT teams within the business and, and they have their own set of um, uh, in, outcomes that they have to work towards and data mesh is not within those outcomes yet. So they are not incentivized for doing the extra work to actually make it a data product, doing the extra work to actually be part of the governance structure that is there. And when you are not incentivized and when you are already stretched, why would you do that? So we are really targeting and going after the business leads to make it part of their uh, 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 structure of, of looking in terms of how they're looking at their teams. So some domains follow, for example, an OKR model. So if one of their objectives is actually to make progress in the data mesh journey, which is not a very good objective, you would ask me, right? Because it should actually lead towards something. But that's a starting point. Even if you can just put that in as your domain as an objective, then it incentivizes the different teams within that domain to actually do and make some progress on your data mesh journey um, in terms of I'm consuming some of the uh, self-service um, uh, 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 um, APIs that are already available. I'm going after the services that are provided instead of building my own. I'm consuming data from a different part of the domain already rather than building myself. And so you basically are taking it as a step-by-step -step approach, but you are only going to get the teams to do it if you get the business leads and the IT leads to agree with you on this. And so for us, it's really targeting um, the incentive structure at the business leadership level and incorporating it into their uh, prioritization model. Perfect, I love that too. Um, it, there's a question in the chat and I'll kind of read it, but this is a question by the way that comes up all the time. Uh, and if you're in a big organization, worked with big organizations, you know this problem, especially if you're a data mesh practitioner, you know this. So, so this comes from Maurice. Uh, can the present presenters share uh, about a transition from a traditional data centralized data management model uh, to a more distributed data mesh approach? How do you affect that journey? Uh, Sarita, we'll start with you. So... I, uh, let's try to define traditional data management model. What I, I just want to make sure I'm saying the same thing as what Maurice is thinking. Um, in traditional models, we get feeds and feeds of data into, let's say, a database, traditional database, and we ETL that data, we lump it together, we make it available, we start reporting on it and running processes off of it. And the difference between a traditional model and, and what we're trying to do with data mesh is um, stop the incoming duplicate feeds of data for the immediate project database problem team that's working on uh, creating a warehouse of data, right? And, and so as I say this out loud, like the, what I'm thinking about is um, if I can only not get that one feed out of 100, and instead of taking that one piece of data in, I go and get access 
to the producer's data product and I go query it. And I didn't create a copy. I didn't have to because I didn't have to, you know, warehouse set up a special specialized warehouse to do any BI reporting. So I, I really can just query it in place, run my process, get on with my day. And that's what I think about as decentralized. And it doesn't have to mean that I entirely unwind the behemoth that was the hundred or so feeds. I unwind one file. Right? and stop getting that copy and stop taking a copy and making my own version of it and taking possession of it and now becoming responsible for that data. Instead, leave it where it is, leave the ownership and subject matter expertise of that piece of data to the data producer, the data product that was created. And I will continue with the business of what I am the expertise on and what I am supposed to be doing. And so, so that's just picking it apart little by little um, and we cannot think that we're going to do it in one fell swoop. Um, it's just too big. Absolutely, absolutely. Amira, well, we'd like to get your perspective, not just on the, you know, how do I transform my centralized data team, but also answer a question, which is, you know, what do I do with my enterprise data warehouse? Can I transition? How do I transition that bundle, monolith, and some may call it, into discrete data products. Can it be done? Should I even try? So Mira, over to you. I think um, it's important to remember that we are talking about two types of um, data use cases and data itself. Um, we are always thinking about um, your operational data, which exists in your um, uh, central warehouses. Think of your SAP systems, for example. And, and then you're thinking about your analytical data. And analytical data is feeding your use cases, which are basically like your predictions, your ML models, algorithms, et cetera. Not all use cases, not all data needs to actually be accessed uh, efficiently 24 seven and is needed for these generations of ML models. These can also be extensive operations, right? Um, so you really need to think for what use case do I need my data products? Um, where does it actually make sense? So exactly the way Sarita was thinking, I think that approach is, is what we are following as well, is that we are not trying to get rid of the existing model, or we are not even trying to get rid of the existing warehouse in its capacity to deal and work with operational data and for all the operational use cases that are associated with that data as well. Um, and we are trying to only find those use cases and those data products where it makes sense. The key focus being reusability. Where does this data actually need to be used across domain boundaries? Where does it need to be joined with use cases where we are joining data from multiple different domains together to bring something new out? And, and, and so I have given the recommendation personally to different domains and teams where the data is in one of their data lakes. Everybody within the team has an understanding of that data lake. The entire use case is only specific to that domain. And when the question came to us, should we make data products out of it? Potentially not, you know, because that data is so specific to you, you understand it, you're dealing with it. So do you get rid of it? Why? So I think it's important that we never just do something for the sake of doing it. The entire company should be made up of data products. No, we didn't do that with microservices either, you know. We really applied it where it was necessary. And I think the same concept applies here as well. Okay, perfect. Great answer. Uh, Sarita, I'm going to ask you a question because uh, I think you mentioned uh, data movement and kind of the challenges with that. But one of the things I've seen is, is uh, those things, uh, those, that, that thing that we call movement there, data movement or data migration are really data pipelines. Um, so the question is this, if I have a data product and another data product, and there's a pipeline in between the two, um, who owns the pipeline? Is it data product one, two, both? How do you, how do you set up uh, that again, I, the reason I mentioned this is, is another example of a quote centralized component, or at least maybe not centralized, but it's not owned necessarily by the data product, uh, unless that might be one of the things you advocate. So, so what do I do with these pipelines that span, don't seem to span an individual data product? It's a tough question. <laughs> You're probably uh, dealing with it as we speak, right? <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Um, Hmm. So I, I again, I think it's uh, the data product team's um, authority to state the boundaries of their own data product. And so if they are committing 
to generate pipelines to further enrich, transform, prepare the data, then it's the data product team's responsibility because they've raised their hand and taken that responsibility and said, this is part of the data product that I've, they also have these pipelines. But on, honestly, the consumer of the data product shouldn't care that that data, that that pipeline exists. They just care that the data, that the data product team is advertising to be available is in fact available. And, and so the data product team would be responsible for those pipelines. Okay. At that point, they may say, that's where my job is done. The consuming team now requests access to that data and may create a pipeline to then enrich, transform and consume it for the need of the consumer. Um, and so that's the consumer's responsibility to run and support that pipeline. And so I think it's within the boundaries of what people are raising their hand and agreeing and taking accountability for is what they are responsible for. I don't think it's ever going to be binary, like always the data product owner or always the consuming team are responsible for the pipeline. Pipeline is a tool that we use to uh, take advantage and, and uh, uh, take uh, opportunities with the data that we have available to us. Absolutely. I know I didn't answer because there's no answer. <laughs> well, well, I think I think there's a few things. I'll, I'll paraphrase a few things, and then Amara, I look for your feedback on this. But what I heard, Sarita, is the data product owner and their team want to take accountability. Then what we do is we expand the boundary to include that pipeline. And as you highlighted, yeah. once it's in the boundary, whatever happens inside the data product doesn't matter. Um, Amara. How have you solved this particular problem? So that's like up for debate and it's been quite <laughs> heavily debated even till today. Um, we have this concept of, I mean, uh, in data mesh, we talk about source-oriented data products. We talk about consumer-oriented data products. Um, exactly because of this problem of who owns the data pipelines in between, um, we are often also seeing spin-off intermediate data products like the aggregate data product that is somewhere not at the source, but also not at the consumer, just so that there's somebody who's responsible for it. Um, I don't think I have a different opinion. Yeah, I, I truly believe it's, it, it's not a binary answer. I also think it's nice uh, to, to give the ownership. If you have actually said that I'm going to pull the data and I'm going to make sure it's aggregated and I'm, I'm taking responsibility for it, I've introduced a pipeline for it, then you're taking responsibility for it as well. You know, um, Having said that, reality is not so easy. It does get messy, boundaries get messy. And then when you're not taking the responsibility, basically you're dependent on somebody else constantly and that's not very efficient. And that starts looking more and more like horizontal slicing versus vertical slicing, which we don't really recommend either. Um, it's a journey. I, there is really no binary answer here yet. Absolutely, it's been my experience also. Uh, I think we probably have time for one more question. So I'll, I'll ask it, Sarita, we'll ask you to start. Um, governance, that big bad word, uh, at least some folks don't uh, definitely don't like it, in my experience, but where does governance fit in the operating model? And how do we balance this local autonomy with the fact that, you know, there are some enterprise-wide mandates that you just have to adhere to? How do, what, what's the balance and how have you seen it be successful? Yeah, I think it goes right back to our conversation on uh, the RACI and the conversation on the Federation of Responsibilities. Uh, at the end of the day, we must protect our data. That's a non-negotiable, right? Protected from various dimensions. Um, uh, laws in different countries necessitate how data is used. Uh, contractual obligations that we have with our partners or with our clients are non-negotiables. We must do the right thing with the data at all times. Reputation risk is a very, very important factor in how we use our data. And, and so there are uh, external rules and contractually obligating rules. And then there's internal um, rules that teams have to abide by. D data is uh, a tremendous asset in the world today. And uh, I, I feel like I sound like a governance uh, advocate, which I am, um, but, but we have to allow then the data product teams. I, I heard on a, I don't know if it was your talk or, or another one, where, you know, you think about a highway, 
right? You're driving down the highway and there are barriers on the sides of the highway. And those are your rules. And if you know that, you're, that those boundaries are there, then you can drive with some peace that you are protected, right? And that you are going to be okay in, in the situation. But if those barriers get too close to the sides of the road, you as the driver will be very, very uncomfortable driving fast or at the speed limit because you're afraid now to hit the barrier. So we have to be really, really smart about how we live within those rules that are intended to keep us safe and to make sure that the data is protected and our clients and our customers and our firm is protected, but not impose it too much that it becomes suffocating and overwhelming to teams to act within it. And, and, and so there's just like this middle ground that we have to find to do that, but we cannot say, hey, let's just take those barriers down. That That's not going to be in the cards. No, absolutely. The the example that I always come to mind is another car example, but um, governance can you make you move much quicker. A classic example is stoplights. If I have a four-way stoplight, if there's no stoplights, everybody would slow down so they could really slowly navigate the intersection and not crash. With stoplights, what I can do is allow people to move forward very, very quickly. They, there's an occasional stop. But now what we have is not only safety, but speed. Um, so, so um, Amira, when you think about governance at speed and enabling and accelerating, things you know that I've seen successful in my experience is having within a data product the ability to instrument and, and capture metrics that are related to governance. So, so are there techniques that you've seen that can, uh, for lack of a better word, automate governance or turn it from a, a governance top-down perspective to a certification and publishing, you know, always having my metrics, governance metrics alive and well, and people can look at it anytime they want. What are the techniques you've seen successful? So um, we actually are using um, quite similar to the to traffic signal concept that you just mentioned in the red light is um, making it really difficult to do the wrong thing. So, for example, if it's automated that you cannot publish your data product on for example, in our company, we use a, a, a data catalog like Colibra. It's not possible to publish on Colibra because it's constrained that you have to basically fill um, hit the MVP checklist of a data product. This MVP check checklist of a data product has been defined by a central governance team, um, primarily with reasonably being the MVP. It shouldn't be over-engineered. It should be really at the core of what is absolutely necessary. So it has to be minimal. And, and this, I think, is advantages in two ways, because if, if you give the central governance team too much uh, power, then we are back to the existing governance structures that we've been trying to fight. And we want to empower the individual domains. And we want to bring um, rational to the decisions that exist that make sense within those domains. But certain aspects like compliance, certain aspects like security, certain aspects that you should not, by default, your data should not be shared, or by default, it has to pass through a certain process if you want to share those aspects of data, um, that can all, all be uh, automated. And that's what makes it uh, part of um, a phenomenal idea of using a data product because you're using fundamentally similar, I like to use the example of Lego bases. So you have to use the same Lego bases and constraints are built into this Lego base that you cannot actually avoid. And all this is then therefore um, automatically traceable, right? So you can have a simple supervision dashboard where you can see, uh, data product A, B, C, D, E are hitting all green lights, but uh, data product F is not because it's failing on this particular SLO metric, which it promised it would hit, right? And that makes it that much more tangible rather than a documentation and a presentation which says these are the guidelines you need to follow. And somebody sitting in a domain and a data product team it doesn't make sense to them, right? And, and so to me, this is the process that we are trying to enable. This is the process that we have tried to kind of kickstart as well, has given us good amount of success. Um, and yeah, it's about bringing the existing data stewards, the existing governance models and the existing governance teams into this fold as well now. Perfect. Now, that's a great way to end it. The, 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 the entire operating model discussion is around how do I move my current organization to take advantage of this new data mesh opportunity. So, so very well said, Amira. 
we are at time. So, so first off, uh, on behalf of the data mesh learning community, I want to thank Sarita, Amara, and uh, Jean-Georges, who had to leave a little earlier. Fantastic discussion. Thank you so much for your wonderful insights. Uh, it was an absolute pleasure. And for those who uh, might have missed this uh, or want to review it again, uh, there will be a recording that will be made available on YouTube. Usually it takes about five to seven business days before uh, uh, we get that uh, published. Um, but we will make sure that uh, there's a recording of this wonderful session uh, in short order. Once again, thank you very much for participating. Uh, your time and patience is very much appreciated. And hopefully you got as much value out of uh, this as we did. So with that in mind, thank you very much, folks. Bye now. Thank you.